symptoms, especially before your OSCEs. We'll also go into some radiology, looking at a bunch of x-rays. Um, we'll look at the most likely conditions given similar presentations, how to appropriately escalate um, in your real life scenarios. Um, we'll summarize and there'll be a chance for feedback and there'll also be another chance for feedback in the middle as well. All right, so um, let's get started then. So we'll start with an SBA. While on call covering the medical wards, you're called to assess a 45 year old male patient on the acute medical ward with severe abdominal pain. Nurses are concerned as he has developed a tachycardia at 120 and is currently using a two. What is the single best next action? And I'll give you 30 seconds for that. So that's from A, ask the nurses for a full set of observations, VBG and ECG before attending the patient. B, rush to the patient's bedside to perform an A to E. C, gather more information on the patient's hospital admission to triage this patient amongst your other jobs before attending to perform an abdominal examination. D, prescribing pain medication appropriately and book an abdominal X-ray remotely, assessing the patient once back from his scan. And F, treat empirically for sepsis, completing the sepsis six following trust guidelines, advice on antibiotics, then calling the medical registrar for further advice. All right, so let's have a look at the poll. We've had a an even split between A, B, and C. No one's gone for D or E. And the answer is C. So gather more information on the patient's hospital admission to triage the patient amongst your other jobs before attending to perform an abdominal examination. So firstly, this patient has an ab abdominal pain, and one of the most crucial things to do in that situation is to put a hand on the patient's tummy. Um, now, A is a valid option. Many would do this, given that you'll be gathering information. However, you don't actually know what's going on at this point. You don't know what's causing the pain, and you don't know why the patient has come in. You only know that he's tachycardic at 120. You can always gather more simple information first, knowing that nurses are very busy and you should manage their workload better. For example, you might find out information that the patient is constipated and then you wouldn't necessarily need for, to do a, a VBG. Um, or you might find out that they've also been vomiting blood and then you need to be attending a lot more urgently. Rush to the patient's bedside to perform an ATE. While well, this is safe, could this be a less urgent job? And given the fact that you'll be called multiple times um, for abdominal pain, often with no clear cause, it's always important to triage this, especially given the fact that you might have other jobs that are more urgent um, for you to be doing. Um, for example, you could be informed of a patient who has a HB of 70, um, a drop from 90, and that would be likely more urgent than this. Um, C is the correct answer as it's crucial to put a hand on the patient's abdomen when they present with abdominal pain, but also because it allows you to triage this situation a lot better. D, although none of you went for it, is a, a bad idea, but you can't put scans without sort of having an idea of what's going on. You can't just put abdominal pain on the um, radiology request, and I'm sure it'll be rejected. Treat empirically for sepsis. Again, you're jumping to conclusions of the diagnosis. Um, and it's safe. However, the medical registrar will just tell you to go examine the patient anyway. Um, so what sort of things do you want to know from the nurse on the phone? Just put whatever in the chat. 
Okay, clearly this was a bit harder. Um, so the thought, sort of things you'd want to know is why they were admitted, um, what medications they're on, the remaining OBS, given that the news too, but however, the news score categorizes things based on sort of a set criteria. So for example, the patient could be febrile, but if they're not above 38.3, I believe, then they won't news for it. So if a patient has a, a temperature of 38, for example, um, and with the tachycardia, you know that this is something to be a little bit more worried about. Um, and what they've been ba at baseline this whole day. So for example, if they've been at baseline of a tachycardia, um, then you know that the difference isn't quite so significant. And I always ask personally uh, if the nurses are particularly worried about this patient. Sometimes they'll call you just because it's best practice to, to get a doctor to review. But a lot of the time they have a good sense for when a patient is off their baseline or it's just the observation that they're a bit more worried about. And in the end, you're treating the patient. So what we gathered from the nurse was that the patient had attended for an infected exacerbation of COPD, had been started on nebulizers, doxycycline, steroids and IV fluids and is recovering well or was recovering well. Other OBS show saturations at baseline of 90, uh, a blood pressure of 109 over 68, a temperature of 37.8 and a respirate of 19. Now, if you notice all the rest of these OBS, the blood pressure here wouldn't necessarily score on the news chart. A temperature of 37.8 won't score. A respirate of 19 won't score. So, but they are somewhat deranged given that the, the normal respiratory rate for, for individuals would be about 12. Um, I didn't give you a baseline here, but if you were to ask a baseline, that would give you a lot more information. Um, and then what would you ask specific, specifically about and do you perform an ATE on this situation? Um, any thoughts, simple yes or no question about whether you would perform an ATE in this situation? Okay, cool. A couple of you would. I think that's very safe, especially when you don't know what's going on. Given the fact that you came in for an infective exacerbation of CBD, you want to assess the airway very well and the breathing. Um, you might as well do the cardiorespiratory system as well. Um, and then when you go to ask the patient um, what it is that's going on, you most likely want to know where, the, where their pain is, whether they've opened their bowels, um, and sort of the nature of the pain, you know, obviously Socrates, the pain at the same time as well. Um, and then you'll ask them what their personal background is, the nature of the pain, etc. Whether they've had anything like this before. Um, and then going on from that, ask some more specific questions. Do you guys know what sort of signs you're looking for on examination? To be worried about a surgical abdomen or the couple of signs that would worry you the most. Perfect, Liam. Guarding and rebound tenderness. Um, if you don't know what guarding is, um, it's when the abdomen is quite tense, when you press on it, the patient kind of moves away or tries to avoid the pain. Um, and rebound tenderness is when you remove your hand from the abdomen, the patient also experiences pain. Now, um, let's have a look exactly what else you'd be worried about. So um, the kind of things you're asking, why they came in, what medications, observations, baseline, we've already said that. Um, and the patient attended, we already went through that. And then the sort of things you're looking for on examination. Rigidity and guarding, definitely. Distension, the location of the pain, whether there are any bowel sounds, and the hydration status of the patient. Um, the most concerning one would be the guarding. Um, and that is sort of the, the basis on which 
um, a lot of surgeons will make their assessment about whether a patient needs surgery or whether they need further investigation, etc. So this patient is guarding, distended. The pain was originally epigastric and is now generalized. Bowel sounds are present. Percussion tympanic. Hydration status normal, warm and well perfused. The chest is wheezy with bibasal crackles. So, the sort of things that you'd want to know, you need to break it down into bedside bloods and imaging. And then you progress forward by doing ECG, a VBG, blood sugar, full set of observations in a urine dip. Essentially, when you've got a patient who is quite so unwell, you want to throw everything you can at them in terms of investigations that are possible at the bedside. This is pretty much your, the, the whole set of things that you can do at the bedside. Um, and then you go on to your full set of bloods. Here you've done an amylase because you're looking for a pancreatitis, as is possible, given that it was epigastric pain. LFTs, as you know, a whole bunch of sort of HPV related issues can also uh, come to light from this. A CRP to look for information, of course, FPCs and use knees, just because they're generally good at telling you if there's an infection or if there's anything else that's going on that you need to be correcting. Um, I put in brackets here lipases. In practice, an amylase is generally more often used, but lipase, I think, is a more sensitive um, to pancreatitis. The sort of investigations of imaging that you would request abdominal x ray and specifically an e uh, an erect chest x-ray um, and we'll go into that a little bit later now is ecg shows sinus tachycardia his blood sugar is a seven the vbg shows a lactate of 2.1 a urine the urine dip is nothing abnormal detected fbc's so a white cell count of 14, a HP of 102, and a CRP of 201. Using these show creatinine of 130. LFTs, nothing abnormal detected. Amylase, nothing abnormal detected. Urine MCS, not back yet. All right, so um, specifically here, what you can see from these bloods, is there's some form of inflammation. The white cell counts raised, so there may be some form of infection. Lactates raised, which also is worrying. Uh, which could show signs of ischemia. Um, the CRP of 201 is quite high, so you would be worried about this. Um, and the creatinine of 130 shows, I think, depending on their baseline, um, some form of AKI. Now, if I saw that having not had any previous context, I would consider an AKI, um, but you do want to look back to see if there's any previous results. And although you'd send off um, all forms of cultures, blood cultures, urine cultures, um, you don't expect them to be back yet. So if you were going to treat for any infection, it would have to be empirical. And the top differentials here would be obstruction, perforation, pancreatitis, upper GI bleed, and cholecystitis. Um, obstruction, given that the patient is distended. Perforation, given that the patient has some form of uh, guarding pancreatitis given the location of the pain an upper gi bleed given that the hb is 102 uh, it could also cause pain and if you're going to further investigate for an upper gi bleed what's the most crucial investigation that you'd then ask for next or perform yourself next So that was if you are going to investigate for an upper GI bleed, what sort of examination would you like to perform next that I haven't done here? Lovely. Yep, yeah, exactly. A PR exam. Um, you'll find yourself calling, thinking, calling the medical registrar, considering a GI bleed. And the first thing they'll ask you is, have you PR'd the patient? Um, and what you're looking for when you do that 
is Melina. Um, and then Carlitos Dias is a good differential here as well, um, although the LFDs show nothing abnormal. Anyway, moving on. So, oh, those were the wrong way around. Here is a chest x-ray, specifically an erect chest x-ray. Um, and what is the most obvious sign present on this chest x-ray? Pneumoperitoneum, specifically air under the right hemidiaphragm here. Um, so that sign there is worrying. And so given that, what is the next best action? Um, so I'll give you another 30 seconds to have a read of that. Um, so A, fast bleep the on call medical registrar, B, fast bleep the on call surgical registrar, C, book the patient in for a C2 abdomen, and then call CT to triage as urgent, D, prescribe IV PPI, IV amox metro ingent, IV fluids and high flow oxygen, and E, put out a medical emergency call. Okay, we've got a 50-50 split between B and C. Um, and the answer here is fast bleep the on-call registrar. Now, I understand the that booking in a CT is incredibly important. It is the definitive diagnostic modality. And the surgical registrar may ask you to do this, but it might be the case that there isn't enough time or it isn't required. Now, another thing with when it comes to booking in these scans, they take time and you need to consider that. But also, when it comes to bleeping someone, they have to call you back. Um, and this is the person that will book them in uh, for theatre, very likely the person who will overnight do the actual surgery. Uh, and given that this is a surgical emergency, you need to call for help. Um, the other ones, unless the patient is medically unstable, bleeping the on-call registrar, registrar is not your first port, port of call. It's the on-call surgical registrar. Um, and prescribing, so amox metro and gent is your standard sort of uh, antibiotic set for any intra-abdominal sepsis. Um, and over here we've got IV, so essentially starting the sepsis six. And it would be very important to stabilize the patient. However, the patient was stable at the time, given the previous OBS. Um, and getting definitive management is much more important at this time. As you perform an ATU, you should also be doing these sort of things. Putting out a medical emergency call. It's a good port of call if you're confused, you don't know what's happening or overwhelmed, but a, a senior help is required from the surgical registrar. Um, if the patient is unresponsive and deteriorates, it becomes much more of a valid option. Um, so I think always prioritize escalation uh, in these sort of situations if the patient is stable. Um, definitive investigations might not necessarily be required and that sort of assessment can be made by a surgical registrar. Um, and having said that, um, a lot of the times when you call the radiologist to ask them for, for example, for these scans, um, you might be stonewalled by the fact that you haven't had a senior review into it. Um, so yeah, any questions on that? <laughs> 
Okay. All right. So diagnosis here is a peptic ulcer, which is a break in the lining of the oh, question. If cre perforate patient, I would say what would be the pathological appearance on a supine radiograph? Um, there is a sign, uh, I think it's called Riglus sign, if you saw on a, oh, do you mean on a chest x-ray? Um, if you see it on a, a chest x-ray, you probably won't see air under the diaphragm um, on, a, on a supine radiograph. The point of when they put them into, um, when they set them up, is that the air pools at the top um, of the, um, uh, of the diaphragm of the abdomen. So it goes underneath the diaphragm. Uh, anyway. Um, yeah. So peptic ulcers are breaking the lining of the gastrointestinal tract, extending through to the muscular layer of the bowel wall. Common causes are NSAIDs, H. pylori, smoking. Did anyone happen to gather the cause for our patient here that we've, um, discussed. It was very briefly mentioned here and it could be a possible cause um, from his medication history, maybe. So smoking increases the risk and given the fact that he was in a COPD patient um no there wasn't an SSR either um it was a very small line there that um was maybe to hint at it it's not written here it's not as common as h pylori smoking and said but it was the steroids peter yeah um he was on steroids there and i didn't note any ppi cover for the patient um so that's a, another one of those things that, that can cause sort of um, ulceration. And if the ulceration gets bad enough or they had a history of ulcers, um, I think that can result in a perforation. Um, so normally there's a history of ulcers with epigastric pain, reflux, gourd, etc. And they're key things to ask about in your history. Normally the patients will just directly tell you. Um, so I remember seeing a patient on the ward and I go up to them and have have you at all heard of any, had any history of sort of heartburn when you've been eating? They tell you straight away, like, yes, I get heartburn all the time. And he sort of leans you in towards um, an ulcer. Um, and there's the main way for differentiating between the two types, gastric and duodenal ulcers, which both fit under the title of a peptic ulcer, um, is pain is worse after meals for gastric ulcers and better after meals for duodenal ulcers. Now, I haven't looked into why this is, um, but in my head, the reason is because when you eat a meal, your stomach produces acid. Uh, and so this acid then irritates um, your stomach lining and the gastric ulcer. Um, and then it's the opposite for duodenal ulcers. Um, I'm sure there's a, an explanation out there if anyone wants to find out. Um, yeah, and then the alternative complications that you could in um, end up having due to peptic ulcers is hematemesis and gastric outlet obstruction. Um, the other one is you could have an, a GI bleed um, as a result of a, an ulcer. Um, and this will very often present with a, a patient with a low HB, or you'll be called by the nurses because the patient has a low HB, um, amongst other symptoms or confusion, etc. And then you'll PR, find Melina, and proceed that way. But that's sort of a a lesson under gastroenterology. Now, peptic ulcers. So, um, this is for sort of, if you have an ulcer, um, oh, I think it maybe came in at the wrong spot. One second. Anyway, if you have an ulcer, um, then the red flags that you're looking for, if that's the case, or if the patient has reflux or dyspepsia uh, or any upper abdominal pain with weight loss and greater than 55 years old, that's a two-week wait, a new onset dysphagia, two-week wait. Um, and if the new onset dyspepsia is not responding to PPI treatment, then also 
the two week wait. Um, and then the treatment afterwards is a PPI with H. pylori testing, given that H. pylori is such a significant cause. Um, and that's normally done with a, a carbon 13 urea breath test or a stool sample. Um, if that comes out to be positive, then you give them the, the trio of Amox, Clary, and Metro for 14 days. Um, and if the symptoms persist after this, they'll require an endoscopy. All right. Um, I heavily recommend that you learn your two week wait rules for exams. Um, they're a bit more obvious in, in an OSCE if you need to do a two week wait. Um, but in an SBA, you can be sort of, um, they come up regularly uh, and you can forget that that's what's required at the time. Um, but the main thing here is to, is to consider a PPI if they have a peptic ulcer without a perforation, obviously, um, or after the perforation. Uh, and then here is a spot diagnosis for you on this SBA. We won't be on it for very long. Um, so I'll give you 30 seconds to answer this one. I think there has to be a poll that comes up somewhere. There we go. Right, heavily in favor of the hiatus hernia, which is correct. Um, so the, the main giveaway here is the, the fluid level. That's not always present. Right middle zone consolidation is just a very vascular lung. Um, aortic dissection, the mediastinum is wider, higher up. Um, neum peritoneum, the gastric bubble is under the left diaphragm here. Um, so you're not worried at the moment uh, about the neum peritoneum because that's just the gastric bubble. Um, and then COPD with cardiomegaly, possibly this lung is hyper expanded, um, but the heart is around one third of the lung width. So there's no cardiomegaly there. Um, so yeah, hiatus hernia. Now we'll whiz through this as it's probably a minor aspect of your exams, but it's important to know the radiological uh, findings. It's often found. I've seen it quite a few times in practice. Um, as an incidental finding on a, a CT chest or a chest X-ray. Um, mostly they're asymptomatic. They might have some uh, symptoms of gourd, chest pain, epigastric pain, and some dysphagia. Um, here we can define a hernia as a, a protrusion of the hole or part of an organ through a wall of a cavity that normally contains it into an abnormal position. What I want you to know is that the two types of hiatus hernias, sliding, which is type one, type two is rolling, which is also paraesophageal. Um, and what I mean by that is that with a sliding, the, the, the stomach and the, um, and the esophagus are continuous. And so part of the stomach following the esophagus rides up into the abdomen, into, into the thorax, sorry. Um, whereas through the esophageal hiatus, um, whereas a rolling one is if you imagine that the, the esophagus remains in the same place, um, but part of the stomach goes in next to it. Um, and so type twos are, are a higher risk associated with the gastric ischemia and volvulus, whereas type ones are more associated with gourd. Um, first line man, uh, investigation, barium swallow, gold standard endoscopy. Um, risk is obesity and increased abdominal pressure, such as if you have an ascites. Um, and the management is mostly weight loss plus PPI. Um, 
If not, then you might require surgery. Um, and for that, you would do a cruroplasty and a fund application. Um, and there's a picture here very nicely. So here, B shows you a paraesophageal, a type 2, and A shows you a type 1. Um, and the surgery here, this is fund application on the left. Um, and, and the cruroplasty is essentially when you make sort of this um, hiatus smaller by putting in a few more stitches in, uh, essentially making the hole through which this um, the gastric contents fit through smaller. And then fund application makes the, the sort of um, junction larger. So it doesn't sort of slide through and rubs up against it. Um, it noted here that sort of the, uh, the complications of this can be burping, some swallowing issues and difficulty, um, or it might just not work. Uh, all right. It's an opportunity to give feedback um, and we'll also get through it at the end as well. Cool. All right. Well, that's about halfway through. Um, here's another SBA. Mrs. JS, a 55 year old female, presents with a cramping abdominal pain, nausea, and bilious vomiting for around 17 hours. She is distended on examination. Her bowels last opened yesterday. What are you most likely to find in her past medical history? Um, a, a recently diagnosed colorectal cancer. B, a history of hyperparathyroidism. C, a background of Crohn's disease. D, previous gynecological surgery. Um, and E, ephemeral hernia. I'll give you 30 seconds for that. Okay, so previous gynecological surgery just etches out as the winner there from you guys. Um, and that is correct. Sorry, I put it down as previous hysterectomy here. Um, and that is correct. So um, what we've got here is a small bowel obstruction. Uh, now, the reason you're thinking small, not necessarily large, is because there isn't a large history, a long history of um, constipation and you've got quite early on vomiting um, now if you think of it sort of anatomically if the obstruction is more proximal um, then you sort of have a blockage much earlier on you've got some feces later on that can still pass um, and when food gets sort of to the to du duodenum or the small bowel it gets obstructed early and so you start vomiting earlier um, now here you've got some possible causes of obstruction. Colorectal cancer is not in keeping with a small bowel obstruction, it's in keeping with a large bowel obstruction. Parathyroidism or hyperparathyroidism. The hyper hypercalcemia can present similarly, um, especially given that the, the, the cramping abdominal pain could be stones, uh, the nausea uh, and vomiting is also common in hypercalcemia, although not necessarily bilious. Um, bilious vomiting is much more common with an obstruction. Um, but it doesn't really explain the distension. Um, a background of Crohn's disease is a less likely cause of small bowel obstruction. Um, a previous hysterectomy now, or previous gynecological surgery, this is the most common cause of a small bowel obstruction is intra-abdominal surgery in general. Um, so small, so 
Katie asked whether repeat that bit about small bowel versus large bowel. So a small bowel obstruction presents with a shorter history, with earlier vomiting, given that it's about 17 hours here, and bowels last open yesterday, meaning there's no significant history of constipation. A large bowel will present with a larger, um, with a longer history of constipation and vomiting later in the presentation, and there'll be a longer history um, of obstruction. Um, and why this is, is because with a, with a small bowel obstruction, the obstruction's earlier on. Um, so essentially, you've still got feces present in the bowel and the large bowel that can pass. But with the obstruction being earlier in the gastrointestinal tract pathway, um, there'll be a blockage earlier from food that's coming in, and that will result in vomiting earlier. Um, whereas if you had a large bile obstruction lower down, you'll have a longer history of sort of constipation. There'll be more space for food to build up in the abdomen. And eventually, once you have sort of, when you reach maybe seven days or so, or a longer period of time, you could start to vomit. Um, but people tend to present with a cramping abdominal pain and a long history of um, constipation. Um, the cramping abdominal pain is common to both. Um, and ephemeral hernia, again, is a possible cause of small bowel obstruction, but is also less likely. Um, the statistics being that um, hernias cause about 5%, um, and uh, uh, the cancers will cause about 5% of small bowel obstructions, uh, with the majority being uh, intra-abdominal surgery resulting in adhesions. Right, so you've completed, um, you've done a, an abdominal x-ray for this patient, um, and this is the appearance of the abdominal x-ray. Um, with this, the, the radiological sign here is called a stacked coin appearance. Um, and uh, one thing that you can sort of definitely visualize here is the valve kind of is sort of extending across the, the whole of the small bowel. Um, whereas in a large bowel, I don't have a picture to show you, but the, the sort of indentations don't extend across the whole way. Um, and the um, size is normally about three centimeters. So, and uh, we've got many large, a small bowel loops there. Small bowel obstruction. It, it accounts for a, a majority uh, of the emergency laparotomies uh, done in the hospital. The major cause is adhesions. The other two most common causes are hernias and cancers, accounting for 5% each. Um, one thing you need to look out for is an electrolyte abnormality causing an alkalosis due to the vomiting, and an alkalosis due to the vomiting, sorry. Um, over time, this can cause ischemia. Now, the way to think of it causing ischemia is if you sort of stretch out the bowel further and further, you, it begins so stretched that it starts to sort of lose the blood supply and the, um, the blood supply begins to be blocked. And so you get sort of this ischemia over time. Uh, the pain is colicky and intermittent um, before the onset of the vomiting, that the pain occurs before vomiting. Um, Again, as mentioned, vomiting happens earlier before the constipation, unlike large bowel obstruction where constipation comes first. Um, and it's not very common. It might it might come up in your SBAs, but um, uh, I spoke to the surgical registrar at my hospital about this. He's only ever heard bowel sa tinkling bowel sounds, which are essentially just high-pitched bowel sounds once. Um, but that is a, one that's noted, uh, a sign that's noted in the literature. Abdominal distension, as you might expect, given that they are backed up with uh, food inside the abdomen. And so it's also tender. How would you investigate it? Um, again, moving with the, the sort of um system of bedside bloods and imaging so a vvg will help determine if there's any ischemia and then this determines the urgency of the situation 
Noted I haven't mentioned um, an ABG yet, as a VBG tend, tends to, to give you most of the information you need. Um, and I was discussing this with some colleagues of mine at SHO who thinks that VBGs are, well, ABGs are almost never required because a, a VBG and some oxygen, and the oxygen saturations will tell you most of what you need to know. Um, anyway, uh, a VBG will show you a lactate, which would help you determine if there's any ischemia. Um, your bloods, standard full set, um, but especially using these FBCs and a CRP. Imaging, initially an abdominal x-ray, uh, but the gold standard for diagnosis is CT, abdomen and pelvis. Uh, in practice, a gastrographin swallow is used if this is not deemed to be acute. Um, now, gastrographin is a radio opaque substance that's um, given orally, and then they'll take serial x-rays to determine um, if there is an obstruction. Um, a reason that surgeons like to give it a lot in practice is there's some very weak evidence that it might sort of help gastric motility, uh, and so it's somewhat therapeutic as well. Your differentials that you'd consider are a large bowel obstruction, appendicitis, pseudo obstruction, and a paralytic ileus. ileus sorry. Um, again, the pain location might help guide you as to whether it's an appendicitis, whether the constipation is present, will help you guide you for a large bowel obstruction. A pseudo obstruction is essentially like saying that you've got an extreme constipation um, uh, and poor gastric motility. And a paralytic ileus is post-surgical. Now, um, so again, the, the background of the patient will help guide you in this direction. The management, I'm sure you've all heard it before, drip and suck. Um, now, it's it's not quite so clear-cut in practice. So um, you want to sort of categorize small bowel obstructive patients into two types, conservative versus active surgical management. Um, and so essentially what you, the reason you want to, to categorize them into conservative or active is with, will this obstruction resolve by itself? Um, so, for example, if you have an obstruction as a result of adhesions, then there's a possibility that this resolves by itself. And so you would give them conservative management, drip and suck, and see if it works. That's not to say that you don't sort of give everyone drip and suck, which is suck, uh, by the way, that means just giving them IV fluids and putting an NG tube in um, to decompress the bowel. Um, that's not to say that you wouldn't give all of them that, but whether it's sort of therapeutic, and manages to treat the, the the obstruction only really ever really works in adhesional obstructions as they can resolve by themselves. Whereas if they've got a cancer, for example, then there's no way that that can resolve uh, by itself. Or if they've got a hernia, then there's no way that that will resolve by itself. And they will require, those patients will require some form of surgery. All right. Um, and the surgery is for those who don't respond to drip and suck, if it's adhesional or if it's cancer or if it's if there's any evidence of ischemia um, or if there's a hernia. Um, and if it's adhesions, you do an adhesiolysis plus minus a resection. Um, if, it's, if it's cancer, then you could stent the bowel if the patient isn't necessarily fit for surgery um, or you can do a bowel resection if they are fit for surgery. Um, and often you can do this laparoscopy and you might not need a laparotomy, uh, a laparotomy being, um, an incision in the abdomen, uh, often midline, um, whereas laparoscopically, obviously with, with cameras coming in and smaller incisions, any questions here? And finally, the most important part for your sort of practice as doctors in the future, initially at least, is that you make, need to make sure that they have adequate VTE prophylaxis and pain management. Um, now, when it comes to prescribing VTE prophylaxis, there's always a guideline. If you think they're going to have surgery soon, then they might not need it. Um, but post-surgery, especially after day two, they'll need VTE prophylaxis. Whether they require parainternal nutrition, um, 
So if, for example, that they're going to be on a, a long time, you anticipate they'll be on a long time on um, an NG feed, they can't tolerate any food uh, and IV fluids, then you might consider parenteral nutrition. You won't necessarily make that decision, but you will need to escalate for such a thing. Um, I think if you had an OSCE station on this, writing down, consider parenteral nutrition um, would be very reasonable. And definitely something you all need to do is prescribe pain management. These patients tend to be in quite a lot of pain. Um, so there's no harm in starting a little bit higher um, with, with a morphine. Um, and if they can't keep anything down orally, then it might be necessary to prescribe this subcut. Okay. Any questions? No. Cool. Moving on. Another SBA, a 41 year old male presents with a history. ETOH means essentially a, a background of a heavy drinking um, or alcoholism. Presents the, to the emergency department complaining of hematemesis. He's been vomiting for around five hours. His observations are stable. His blood come back as NAD. What is the most likely diagnosis? Hopefully, give you a few more seconds to respond to that. Okay, so most of you have gone for a Mallory Vice Chair, a couple of you have gone for bleeding varices. Oh, there we go. Most of you have gone for a Mallory Vice Chair, a few have gone for bleeding varices. Some have gone for boar herbs and some have gone for a peptic ulcer disease. All right, so. The answer here is a Mallory Vice tear. Now, if you've never heard of this, it can be quite a, a confusing one, um, or at least um, it sounds quite daunting. Although all it means is essentially a self-limiting tear um, within the esophagus, minor tear. Um, and here you've got a, um, a history of hematemesis. Um, now, the key part of this question is that it says he's been new hematemesis after he'd been vomiting for a few hours. That should instantly direct you to two, um, to two uh, differentials here, boar halves and a Mallory vice tear. Um, bleeding varices are possible given that he's got a history of alcoholism, but he's much more stable given that his observations are stable and his blood's come back as nothing abnormal detected. Um, uh, and so you'd expect someone to be a lot less stable if that was the case, if you had bleeding varices. Um, peptic ulcer disease, again, but they would result in a melina or coffee ground vomiting, and they're also unlikely to be after a bout of vomiting, the likely start of vomiting. Um, esophagitis is probably the second most likely uh, answer here, um, but a long-standing history would be present, not just after vomiting. Um, and yes, an esophagitis can cause a hematemesis. Um, which leaves you with Mallory revised tear and boar halves. Now, um, boar halves is a, a full thickness tear in the esophagus, similarly after vomiting, um, but where it results in abdominal contents leaking into the thorax, resulting in sepsis or um, uh, sort of um, inflammation in general, and presents with a triad of chest pain, respiratory distress, and subcutaneous emphysema. Um, the subcutaneous emphysema is one of the, the less common symptoms that they um that you find or examination findings but you will see chest pain and respiratory distress um they'll need ate stabilization urgent ct with oral and iv contrast um and surgical management often and uh, 
this is also less common than a Mallory vice chair, which is similar, more likely in those with the ETOH history. Um, but this is much more self-limiting. You treat it conservatively. They do need an endoscopy within 24 hours due to the etiology, um, uh, due to, def to define the etiology of the bleeding in case this can be more serious. Um, and it tends to streak the vomit as opposed to be just hematemesis frank. Um, but it can also present in other sorts of hematemesis. It can present as coffee ground. It can also present um, as frank as well, but most likely to streak. It's one to be aware of. Again, this is the sort of thing that comes up for uh, one SBA, um, but very quickly now that you'll know it um, for the future. Um, and it's a good differential to throw out when it comes to any form of hematemesis. A 60 year old male gentleman presents to the GP with three weeks of abdominal pain and weight loss. He's a past medical history of reflux for which he takes a meprazole and smokes around 15 cigarettes a day. Um, what is the most urgently required investigation? That's A, an OGD, B, full blood count, C, CT cap, D, a barium swallow, and E, a colonoscopy. Okay. 80% of you have gone for an OGD and that's correct. Um, the, the key thing here is the most urgently required investigation. Now, OGD is the most appropriate initial investigation for diagnosing an esophageal cancer. Now you're considering this because he meets the two week wait criteria for esophageal cancer. He smokes, has a history of reflux and takes a meprazole. CT cap will be required later for staging, but won't confirm your diagnosis. Whereas an OGD can, as especially because it can take samples and send them off for cytology. FBCs won't show much. Uh, a barium swallow is useful, but won't confirm the diagnosis. Um, and a colonoscopy, if considering colorectal cancer, then this is the go-to, but it is not the go-to for when considering um, esophageal cancer. All right, so there's, from an upper GI perspective, at least, there are two cancers to be aware of, gastric and esophageal. Um, they're both generally managed by gastroenterologists, but surgical management is occasionally required. Um, esophageal cancer is broken down into adenocarcinomas and squamous cell carcinomas. The risk factors for adenocarcinomas being Gord and Barrett's esophagus, um, and these tend to occur, adenocarcinomas tend to occur in the lower one third um, of the um, esophagus. Uh, and then squamous cell carcinomas um, tend to be, the risk factors for those are smoking and alcohol, and they tend to occur in the upper two thirds of the esophagus. Um, the way I thought of it is that you smoke and you drink from the mouth, and so it affects the upper region. Um, and when there's reflux, it comes from the abdomen, um, or there's any gourd or barrets, and it comes from the sorry, from the, um, from the stomach up into the esophagus and that hits the lower one third. Um, that's how I remembered it. I hope it helps. Um, adenocarcinoma is more common in the UK, but squamous cell carcinomas are more common abroad or worldwide at least. Um, your presenting complaints are generally dysphagia, autonophagia, which is pain on swallowing. Um, dysphagia is obviously difficulty swallowing. Hoarseness, um, which is uh, often missed. Um, occasionally a patient will come in with like, my voice has changed. Um, and that's something to be worried about. Um, they'll also either for, for the two week weight criteria present with weight loss and one of either reflux, dyspepsia or abdominal pain, um, upper abdominal pain that is. Uh, 
and they have to be also over 55 years old. Um, so they come in with either a very significant symptom or a combination of age, weight loss, and uh, a more minor symptom for them to meet the criteria. Uh, and so sort of the, the gold standard investigation is an OGD, as we discussed earlier. Um, if it's caught early, which is much less likely, um, then it can be endoscopically resected. However, if not, and there is no metastasis or nodal involvement, so that would be a, a T1 or 2, but um, N0, M0 uh, in your um, criteria, then you can do an either Lewis esophagectomy, which is, well, at least you can do an esophagectomy. The most common procedure used is an either Lewis, which essentially requires, which is a, a very large undertaking, which requires a thoracotomy um, and laparoscopic uh, surgery in the abdomen. Uh, and essentially what they do is they, they cut the esophagus off um, or the part of the esophagus that they need off, um, reconnect it and pull some of the stomach up into the um into the thorax to fashion a new esophagus um it's a surgery that has a lot of high risks high mortality um and is not for the more unwell or um functionally uh, lower status patients and then gastric cancer um the, what i want you to know is that it's most commonly caused by H. pylori, um, but also nitrate heavy diets, which can, um, and so can a trophic gastritis. Um, it can present with abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting, B symptoms, um, and rarely upper GI bleeds. Um, you always feel for a Verkaus node and abdominal examination, and this is commonly um, where um, gastric cancer spread to. Um, the other node is a systemary Jane node uh, that you might want to know about. Um, an OGD is another, again, the gold standard investigation, which shows signet ring cells. Um, that's um, when you sort of biopsy it uh, and look at it under the microscope. Uh, and management involves either endoscopic resection or gastrectomy that may be a partial gastrectomy. And again, the two-week weight criteria is similar, similar to esophageal cancer. Any questions so far? Okay. Another SBA. Um, you're covering the uh, general surgery wards um, over the weekend when you are called to assess a patient four days post-op for a laparotomy with a small bowel resection um, for a laparotomy with a small bowel resection for a small bowel obstruction. Um, the patient is nauseated with some pain in the right hypochondrium. The patient is afebrile, distended, tachycardic. Um, this is one of the last slides. So the session will do to be finished in about five minutes. Um, Distended, tachycardic, tachypneic, desaturating, and drowsy. Um, a VBG comes back in NAD. Um, yeah, a VBG comes back as NAD. ECG comes back as ST, which is sinus tachycardia. Uh, prophylactic anoxaparin has been given from day two post-op, uh, and a full set of bloods have been sent. Um, you've bleeped the medical registrar. What is the next best step they're likely to advise you? 
give you a few more seconds. So the answer here is uh, a CTAP plus IV fluids. All right, so I've added IV fluids to most of these, and in, in IV fluids would be included in the, in the sepsis 6. Now, um, because obviously if the patient is nauseated or vomiting, they can't keep any fluids down, so they're going to need intravenous fluids in general. Um, now, furthermore, uh, let's work through it, the other options. Now, a CTPA would identify a PE, um, you don't have enough information yet for a PE to be the most likely diagnosis. Now, if you remember your uh, well score, the PE well score, um, there's four points given for PE is the number one diagnosis there. Uh, and so there are other things that could be caused this. Now, PE is possible, um, given that this patient is post-op, but it's made less un less likely by the fact that he's already been given prophylactic and oxyparin. Um now, moving on to NG plus IV fluids. If you're considering that the patient would be reobstructed or has an ileus, um, a reobstruction is less likely so soon after surgery. Um, an ileus is very common um, and quite likely. Um, however, um, a CTAP is used to sort of rule this and compare this to an ostomatic leak, which we'll get to. Sepsis 6, the patient is afebrile and we don't have any inflammatory markers at this point. You've done your bloods. If the bloods come back with a raised white cell count or a CRP, then you can start your sepsis six. Um, now I understand um, here that I've said that the patient is tachycardic and tachypneic and desaturating, but if you remember, but I would point to the QSOFA score, um, which it has three criteria. Is the patient newly confused, has a raised respiratory rate greater than 22 and a systolic blood pressure of less than 100. You need two out of those three to be considering sepsis as your main diagnosis here. Um, while the patient is tachypneic, I've not pointed out that he is at all. Um, he is at all confused and I have not given you a blood pressure here um, to guide you uh, in the way of thinking that it's sepsis. And he's uh, afebrile. Sepsis is a good one to consider in all of these patients. And it's possible that the patient could be septic, septic given um, an osteomotic leak. But it's not your first thing to go for. And it wouldn't be what rules out the most important things to rule out, given that it's a surgical patient. Chest x-ray plus IVF. Now, you'll be considering here atelectasis and a chest infection. And if this is negative, then you'd consider a CTPA. However, it doesn't explain the distension. Um, and again, we've already mentioned that the, the reason for the IV fluids. Um, and you would need to assume that the patient has a post-op ileus. Now, day four is the most common day to have an anostomotic leak. Um, and a leak would explain all the symptoms and is dangerous. It would explain the tachycardia, the, the tachypnea, the desaturation. Um, it would explain the distension. Um, the nausea and the vomiting, um, and uh, it would be in fitting with a small bowel resection and a laparotomy. Um, if he was to have a um, a, uh, a post-op ileus, those two sort of come hand in hand, present really similarly, and so when there is a patient you're considering that has a post-op ileus, you would still do a CTAP to rule out an anostomotic leak. If you called the general surgical registrar at this point, um, they would likely advise you to um, request a CTAP. Um, and then if that comes back as negative, you would then consider going for a chest X-ray and then a CTPA um, otherwise. So you need to kind of put it into context um, with what's going on. Um, any questions there? This is quite a tough, que uh, quite a tough question. Um, less than 100 systolic is what would give you a QSOFA score of 1. Um, 
Yeah, respiratory features in an astomotic leak. Um, if you consider that a, a patient sort of um, has pain, then that could also cause him to have a, a raised respiratory rate. Um, general inflammation, or if there is any form of um, bowel ischemia uh, as a result of the leak, etc., cetera, um, or causing the leak, um, then it's possible that that uh, can cause a raised lactate and your, your body would compensate um, to blow off carbon dioxide and cause the respiratory features in an anastomotic leak. Um, inflammation generally comes with that sort of um, increase um, in, attack, uh, in breathing rate. Does that answer the question? If not, just pop another question in uh, the chat. Um, and so then on the last slide here, um, regarding post-operative complications, probably the thing you'd be managing most as an F1, especially on your on-calls um, on general surgery. Uh, and they come, I've named here five of the main ones, um, but there's others that you should be aware of as well. So a post-op infection, chest, urine, abdomen, rule those out. Um, Often a VPG can guide you in the right direction with with a pyrexia um, and prescribe antibiotics appropriately. A VTE, especially if a VTE prophylaxis has been missed uh, in the process, um, given that can be sort of a, um, a DVT or a PE. Um, atelectasis. Again, very common, most common within 24 hours of surgery. Make sure that you've prescribed analgesia to help the patient breathe better, as, sort of, as you can imagine, sort of pain when you're breathing um, as your diaphragm pushes down into the abdomen. Um, if you were given analgesia, you might not necessarily feel this pain. You can take deeper breaths in, expand the lungs and prevent an atelectasis. Atelectasis can also cause a chest infection, uh, given the buildup of secretions and the lack of movement of sorts of fluid around um any form of stasis will cause this and then an ostomotic leak again look for guarding uh, and guarding and rigidity around days three to five um can be very severe and can also cause a sepsis um so look out for that as well post-op ileus presents similarly to obstruction it's very common um and can also present similarly to an anastomotic leak, um, given the distension, nausea, vomiting. Um, but it's not quite as painful as a leak, but you need to rule this out with a, a CT outer and pelvis. Again, the management drip and suck, just like an obstruction. Reduce the opiates and consider any electrolyte imbalances that could be causing this. Now, post-op electrolyte imbalances are very common. Um, magnesium is often one that's missed and that can cause your post-op ileus. And then the other post-op complications that you need to be aware of, pain, make sure they've got adequate pain medication prescribed, nausea and vomiting, um, prescribe an antiemetic, um, pyrexia, um, post-op pyrexia is common. Uh, I've seen quite a few patients on the ward with a pyrexia, that you, no other features sort of an infection. Just monitor uh, and pres prescribe paracetamol. Um, to reduce the, the fever. Um, Post-op bleed, again, very dangerous, very worrying, escalate if you think that's what's going on. AKIs, again, very common, IV fluids and hold any medications that could precipitate an AKI or worsen it. Um, retention, by, I mean by that urinary retention, again, common after surgery, catheterize. Um, electrolyte imbalances, that could be sodium, high or low, potassium high or low, calcium high or low, and magnesium. Um, and remember, you can't correct magnesium without correcting the calcium. Uh, sorry, you can't correct the calcium without correcting magnesium. Wound infections, which can also in themselves cause dehiscences, which is essentially um, when the, the repair breaks open completely. And now this is a surgical emergency. Um, and if you see this come up in... in SBAs, I suppose it's unlikely to come up in an OSCE. Um, the treatment here is saline soaked gauze and immediately booked in to return to theatre to close the wound. Um, 
and then infection can cause this prescribe antibiotics appropriately as for the infection and send off your wound swabs all right uh, and that's pretty much it um for for this uh, for today so to, to summarize your first job when called is to, uh, by the nurses on call um, is to triage your jobs and gather any information uh, that you need um, to allow you to do this. Don't forget to be able to interpret your radiology and remember to, to revise it before your exams. Remember to escalate appropriately after gathering information and stabilizing the patient. And even then, if you need help stabilizing the patient, then of course, escalate then as well. Get a good past medical history will guide you to a diagnosis. I know a lot of the time you practice your A to E's um, you practice your A to E's on, a, on a, a dummy or someone who doesn't speak. Often the patient can speak. Um, and so you can very quickly determine a lot of information from, from them um, by taking a very quick history. Uh, I think the, the acronym that I use then and you still use now is sample. Look it up. Um, remember your two-week wait rules. They come up for a lot of questions in your SBAs and are easy marks although not very easy to remember, I guess. Um, escalate your management investigations appropriately. Um, so start with bedside bloods and then imaging and try and predict what a medical slash surgical registrar will ask about before you call them and sort of preempt that. So you say that you've already done this. Uh, it makes you feel a lot better about yourself when you're a doctor. Um, do your A to E's and BBG's um and post-op complications are the bread and butter of all on-call surgery as an f1 um and to summarize the 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 conditions we covered we covered a perforated viscous generally the manager would be similar for other uh, perforations hiatus hernia small bile obstructions malaria vice tears versus borehards gastric and esophageal cancers and post-op complications all right thank you everyone um references if you wanted them and then um feedback form for a certificate of attendance thank you very much Thank you for that comprehensive whistle stop tour throughout Upper GI surgery. I think that was a really good session with some really good questions. Uh, and thank you everyone for interacting. Um, we'll close it off here then. I'll um, end the call from down below if that's all right with you. Sure, that's all good. Thank you. Good thank night. Thank you very much. Thank you all.